trust you brought your Bibles with you this morning. If you haven't, maybe you can find one on the back of the pew. Uh, I'd like to invite you to turn to uh, Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. It's a text I've read many times, and it's, it's a good text, and uh, it kind of encourages you along. Let's read it. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one that thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. May God bless the reading. May God bless you this morning. Sharing your faith, maybe you've already looked at it, just maybe read the story that's in the very beginning of a mother that never stopped praying, and we need to be like that. She was a witness to her own child and probably saved his life, and her prayers made him call, and when he called, she shared her heart. Ron says this is a, a text we know. What do you get out of a text like this? I want to read it real slow to you. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, <clears throat> forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. As I thought about this sermon, Friday, not Friday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, the title is Talk Faith and Move Forward. I'm going to share with you where I got that title in the very end. But this is a sermon on forgetting the past. Any of you hold grudges? Any of you love to bring up the past? Last week, I had a sermon, three things that we need in order to worship God. And this week is like a follow-up. The first text I'd like to read is John 17, 1 through 4. If you'll turn in your Bibles to John 17, 1 through 4. If you read this little book, it's about a mother praying for her son in the beginning, talking about witnessing. But this prayer is even greater than hers. John 17, 1 through 4, it says, These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest to me. Jesus Christ is praying for you and I. Not a mother for a son, but Jesus praying for you and I. And we know Christ. We can know Christ in one sense that he is the Savior of the world. It, mean, it means more than this, though. We must have a personal knowledge and experience in Christ, an experimental knowledge. Last week I told you that we need to know God, and I've explained and explained 
To know someone is to have a relationship with them. Not to know about them, but to know them. And you and I need to have an experimental knowledge of Christ. We need to test what we believe in Him. It should tell us what He is to us and what we mean to Him. It should be an experience that everyone should want and desire to go after. You could have the greatest, the wisest teacher found in the world. <clears throat> you could have the wisest, the best pastor. But it's still going to be up to you to find Jesus. It's not going to be up to someone else. No one can think or act for you. So the question you need to ask yourself today is this. Am I determined to develop a character which God can approve of? You can give yourself up to float with the current, or you can struggle onward and upward. The approval of God is worth more than all else in the world. At least it should be. And this work that is done for us is to be through the manifestation of the Spirit of God. The human heart, the mind's got to be open for God to talk to us. Do you hear Paul's story today? He was getting emotional. Don't take a lawnmower away from him. <laughs> Don't even take a washer away from him. It meant something to Paul to have that washer show up. It probably meant even more to him to know he prayed for a washer and got two. Are you that emotional for God to answer a prayer? Would finding a washer bring you to tears? The work is done for us, brothers and sisters. The Holy Spirit's here to do anything that you want and need to get to heaven. But you have to have a heart that's purified and sanctified. I need not tell you all this because you know it already. Not one of us needs to feel doubtful of where we stand with God today. If you do, you need to have a closer relationship with Jesus. Can you say today, I wish I knew where I stood in God's sight? By living out your faith, we must sink ourselves into God. Why was the Bible written? It was so you could find God. We're lost, brothers and sisters. He's looking for us. But the answer's in this book. Why does it seem to be that, that maybe as a church, you ever felt this church is going nowhere? It isn't growing like it should. Why is that? Is it me? Is it you? Do you think our church is headed in the right direction? Or maybe you don't care, you're just a visiting member. But I have something come to me. Someone comes to me and says, Pastor, what's, what's the matter with us? I don't have the answer, but Look at James chapter 1. James 1, 5 and 6. James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Sometimes people come to other people for answers. In the Bible, giving you and I advice, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him what? Ask the pastor. That, oh, ask of God. That giveth to all men what? Liberally. And abradeth not, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in what? Faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth, is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. 
Brothers and sisters, you and I have got to have faith. Enough faith and a relationship with God to be able to go to Him and ask anything that we want that's for our good. And it says He'll give it to us. You believe that? You'll know you believe it as if there's ever a time you need a friend and you call somebody instead of going to God. You'll know right then that you need another human being because to talk to God requires something called faith which is a belief in things that you've never seen. But to hear a human voice on the other end of a phone, that's what we desire. And that person may or may not have what you need. In fact, they may give you what you think you need and it may be the wrong answer to what you need. So here's the answer. You pray, and then a cloud comes. You could almost hear the cloud in Paul's voice. What was the cloud? He was going to have to wait four more days for the third washer. So a little doubt comes, and it will, because God will allow it to see if you trust Him. We must ask God for wisdom, strength, efficiency, and desire to have them. But perhaps right after the prayer, it, se it seems like the devil's right there with a shadow, and you can't see any way out of what you're praying about. And what is this? It's the devil challenging your faith, God allowing him to do it, to see which way you'll go. Are we to sink our faith in this cloud of doubt? That's what Satan wants. But we should not give him this pleasure. So what are we going to do? Look at Philippians 3, 13 and 14 again. And what's it say? It says, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it. Paul's saying that he isn't perfect. But this one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to forget about the past. The devil will take your past, brothers and sisters, and he will drive you crazy with it. Not only things you've done wrong and whether or not you're forgiven, but things that people have done wrong and whether you've forgiven them. I don't know how long or how many times I prayed the Lord's Prayer. But it wasn't until I became an Adventist and someone preached on it that he says in there that you will not be forgiven unless you forgive everybody else. Do you know that? It says in there, Father, forgive me as I have forgiven who? others you're asking God this don't forgive me if there's somebody I haven't forgiven you're asking that can you pray the Lord's prayer and repeat those words with what you may have hanging on you and in you he says, no, my new goal, I'm going to press toward the mark for the prize hall calling, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know when he went to Mars Hills, and there was all the gods were there. And the old Paul could bring up his philosophy. He could bring up all his theology. And he could have probably went in and annihilated every one of those gods. But he says it's a waste of time to fight people on what's not true. He says, no, from now on I'm going to talk about the unknown God. I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You don't have to disprove error, brothers and sisters. Truth disproves untruth. You don't have to get a perfect speech down on why the secret rapture is not true. 
All you need to do is prove the 70 weeks. It disproves it. We don't have to study all the air. And that's what Paul's saying here. All I'm going to talk about is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And if you can have a relationship like that with Jesus Christ, He will give you the Holy Spirit and you'll be His. There had been so many unpleasant experiences in Paul's life. Beatings, imprisonment, shipwreck, just to name a few. You know the life he had. Did the Jews like him anymore? He was a traitor. But Paul says, I'm not dwelling on that. Somebody needs to hear the gospel. He doesn't care if a serpent comes out of some sticks that he's gathering. He shakes it off. He wants to think of the future. It would have been so easy for Paul to brood over his memories. When he came to the disciples, did they want him? Paul easy could have become bitter. He could have went ingrown. He could have shriveled his soul up with what his past contained. But instead he becomes one of the greatest missionary preachers. He writes almost the whole New Testament. And why? Because he says, I want to talk about Christ and Him crucified. I want to talk about the one who turned me from hating Christians to loving Christians. Somewhere along the line, Paul must have learned of the dangers involved in dwelling on miserable experiences. From this knowledge, he wrote remarkable words to the beloved group of the Christians in, the, in Philippi. And he tells them, I don't know about you, but I'm not thinking of the past anymore. My human nature will come up. And brothers and sisters, human nature is no different today than it was back then. Groping and living with problems. Thinking about unhappy experiences. So what should we do? And the answer is, pray. The wise young Christian will present problems to the Lord knowing that by himself he cannot keep these thoughts from intruding. He might send a quick prayer heavenward asking God for special help. But you must ask in faith, nothing wavering. If you ask God for something, if you give him your problems then you can't bring those problems up again. They're not your problems. Do you believe that? You've given them to God. They're His problems now. Jesus says, Casting all your care upon me, and the Lord will do great things for us if we will only show Him He can. What we want, brothers and sisters, is a faith that will not let go. A faith that will not fail or become discouraged. I know your faith will be tried, and I know the banner of truth has, to, has got to be lifted up in all places. When I hear the word discouraged, you ever been discouraged? Are you discouraged? Whenever I hear that, who comes to mind in the Bible? I'm telling you, for 40 years, Job didn't get discouraged. Job was what? Patient. We call about the patience of Job. It's Joshua. Joshua was the sidekick to Moses. He watched all the garbage. He was one of the spies. He came back and saw ten turn on him, and then all of Israel turned on him. It said they were going to stone Moses, Caleb, and Joshua. And when it's time to bury Moses, and when it's time to cross the Jordan, he gets them. He gets all those Israelites. Were they any better? Was the second, third, fourth generation any better? And what does Moses tell Joshua? Be strong and of good Courage. And what's the opposite of courage? 
discouraged. Don't get discouraged. God told Joshua not to get discouraged. Be strong and of good courage. I can only tell you that as a pastor. Brothers and sisters, it's going to get worse. You and I are waiting to see Jesus. Before that happens, we're going to see a time of trouble like we've never seen. Oh, I won't get discouraged, Pastor. Brothers and sisters, you don't know that. What we want is a faith that won't let go. A faith that will not fail or be discouraged. And we're all going to be tried. And when we come to the hardest places, we may know, we have the ability to know, that all heaven is interested and will bear us up if we will not fail and be discouraged. Cling to Jesus. That's why I put this up today. I think Paul was clinging to Jesus over a washer. I'm not mocking that. The man loves to cut grass. He's four or five days behind. He's four or five more days behind. And some thought comes into his mind, well, you can't fix the more, fix the trunk. Who do you think gave him that thought? That he moves something and the washer falls out. But one blessing isn't enough. He moves the more and there's the other washer. And, and, and I don't pray his more breaks down, but he's got a spare. And he's happy over a washer. What is God over a soul? Don't get discouraged. Cling to Jesus. He is or is not the mighty deliverer. Do not talk unbelief at all. Why did the ones that didn't make Canaan not make Canaan? There's one little verse in there. It says they did not enter the promise because of unbelief. Doesn't say murmuring. Doesn't say killed anybody. Doesn't say about the illicit things they did with the Moabitish women. It says your, your older people that did not walk across the Jordan did not come here because of unbelief. Did they believe there could be water? They did not. Did they believe there could be food? They did not. And you and I, brothers and sisters, are going to walk through the pearly gates if we believe. And the word you can use is your faith. We can sing hymns. I can't help but say a word. I can think of a hymn. My faith is built on nothing less than Paul would say than Jesus Christ. Are you clinging to Jesus? Is He your all? Because the more you talk unbelief, the more unbelief you'll have. The more you talk darkness, the more darkness you'll have. The more you talk discouragement, you get the point? Now listen, the more you talk light, the more light you have. The more you talk faith, the more faith you have. Look at John 17, 14 through 19. The book of John. John 17, 14 through 19. Jesus says this. It's in red letter if you have a red letter. I have given them my, thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so also I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified by what, brothers and sisters? By the truth. This is the truth. Your sanctification today is whether you believe in this book. We're coming to hard times. I could give, get up here and talk love to you. 
I've had people come and say, say, Pastor, all our pastor talks about is love. Well, is love wrong? But brothers and sisters, we are headed for the end of the world. And we need encouragement, and it's in this book. The truth of God must sanctify the whole man, body and soul. It is not the truth to you unless you practice it. Should I repeat that? It's not the truth to you unless you practice it. Living for Jesus. Our precious Jesus gave up all heaven to come to this world that he might sanctify us through this book. Will we be sanctified? In his life and example, his lessons and his words, there was a sanctification of the Spirit of God. Sanctification was upon him for us. God himself worked through humanity just as humanity must work through humanity. That is why he took humanity upon himself that he could teach us humanity how to work for itself. He took humanity that he might experience death in our behalf that we might have life and immortality through his life and death. It's studying the life of Christ that you become like him. Ellen White says it. She says, by beholding, you become changed. I want to share a quote from a man named Ty Gibson. Many of you that have 3ABN know him. He wrote a little book. It was called Seeing with New Eyes. And this is what he said. History is filled with men who would be God. But only one God who would become man. God became a human being, brothers and sisters, in the person of the man, Jesus Christ. And the reason he did this is perhaps more marvelous than the fact that he did it. Staying with John 17, look at verse 20. It's the prayer for the church. My, my Bible has a heading. I like Bibles that have headings all, every now and then. And if yours has one, I hope yours says that. This is red letter. It's Jesus praying, and my title is The Prayer for the Church. That's you and I today. It says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So Jesus prayed for these folks. They wrote the rest of the Bible. And Jesus is saying, I'm praying for those that read the Bible. That's you and I. Verse 21 says, That they all may be what? One, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The world's going to believe in Christ when they see Christ in you. It's the church that's supposed to show Christ. He's the head of it. Continuing, it says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. And the last verse, 23, it says, I in them, thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Brothers and sisters, if you read that real slow at the end, it says that God will love us as he loved Jesus. Is that earned by you and I? We're all sinners. Jesus is praying that the Father will love you like he loved his Son. How much do you think he loved Jesus? But John 3.16 says, For God so loved what? The world. That he was willing to give up that son that he loved. Jesus left heaven. Jesus came to this earth. And why did he do it? Because of you. It's a wonderful thing that God loves them that believe in him as he loves Jesus himself. We are made one with God and we want that oneness. Do you want that oneness? You'll, you'll tell God you want that oneness by how much time you spend with Him. And the time spent on your knees praying and Bible study. 
We want to seek Him earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. And we want the spirit of the third angel's message. We want to realize that the end of all things is at hand. That speech is a talent. That faith is a gift. And we must work and pray that God will preserve that faith. You must. You must. I can't do it for you. You must put your hand right on the Word of God and say, I believe and I will believe. I will press toward the mark that Paul was pressing forward to. I will forget the past. And everything that hinders me shall be swept away. I will not allow anything to interpose between my soul and the Savior. And there's another hymn. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. And some people, brothers and sisters, have a lot of things between their soul and the Savior. The dark shadow of Satan will come right across your path if we let our faith sink into it. But we must do as an eagle does. When there's fog, when there's thick clouds, when there's a storm, an eagle does not stay in its nest and brood and wish it could fly. It takes off and goes up. And what's above the stormy clouds? Anybody here fly? Well, it's amazing. As black and as terrible as it is, you get in a plane and once you cut through those clouds, the sun's out. And that's what an eagle has built into it. And you and I don't. We need to strive to have that ability of an eagle. And when the clouds come, fly up. Fly up. Another song, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. You and I, brothers and sisters, have got to find Jesus. Not all the problems, not all the trials, not all the things. What do you like to talk about? Take God at his word. We must have it. And God will let us have it if we will. Submit your will. We must not get discouraged. Oh, pastor, you're telling me as a human being I shouldn't be discouraged. I'm telling you as a human being you may get discouraged. You better get out of your discouragement. God doesn't discourage. You think discouragement comes from God? You think he tells, tells Joshua to be strong and of great courage even though I'm going to dump discouragement on you? Well, he dumped on him. He got those same people Relatives of the same people that didn't make it. Brothers and sisters, we've got to get rid of unbelief. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to act it out. We shouldn't even think about it. We must press forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Daniel 12.1. I hope you know it. Daniel 12.1. The last, in the last book of Daniel. I hope you have it memorized. I hope you know it's here. It says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which stands for who? the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, brothers and sisters, if you have faith to believe it, at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Written in what book? Book of Life. We're going to close today and sing a song and the chorus is, Is My Name Written There? You know the song? Is my name written there on the page white and fair? In the book of my Savior, is my name written there? What kind of witness are you to the love of God? Psalm 50. 
verse 23 says this. Whosoever offendeth, whosoever <laughs> offers praise glorifies me, God says. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. I took my title for this sermon, Talk Faith and Move Forward. I like reading a book. I was going to bring it and I forgot. It's Talks by Ellen White. Sermon Talks by Ellen White. It means sitting down and reading a sermon she preached. And if, if we could hear her voice, maybe we could hear her talk. But I have volume one and volume two of all her sermons. And they're long, so don't worry. I won't preach her sermon, but I was reading through, reading her sermons, and I came across this one. It isn't this sermon. But I read the sermon through, and it says, it's entitled, Talk Faith and Move Forward. And I want to read one paragraph from that sermon. It's found on page 310, if you ever see the book. Number One Sermon Talks by Ellen White. It says, you are going to have trials in your churches. It's, it's a verse for a pastor. She says this, but I'm going to give it to you. You are going to have trials in your churches. Not only me, but you are. You are going to have trials in your churches because there are murmurers and complainers and fault finders there. But listen to what she says. It sounds like Joshua. Go straight ahead, she says, and be cheerful. Do not let your head be cast down. Do not feel discouraged. There's that word. But go forward, firm in Jesus Christ, keeping your eyes fixed on the crown of life, which Christ, the righteous judge, shall give you in that day. And she continues and says, just keep praising God, and when the devil tempts you, sing. If you keep reading in there, she talks about Jesus. She says this, When Christ was a child, he was tempted in every way. And what did he do? He sang psalms, praise God, and there was music in his voice. And there was an impression made upon hearts and minds of those who heard him. He wants you to have heaven in view. And heaven is a good deal nearer than you think. God's holy anointed ones are right by you. And here's his church. And I don't know if you've read what she thinks about the church. But this is what she was told to write. And here is his church. The greatest object of his love that it is possible for him to have. Do you hear that? His church today... This church, with all the faults and everything, is the greatest object of his love that it is possible for him to have. And God is love. And the last sentence says, He is watching over every one of us. So how are you? Is your name written there? In the book. On the page, white and fair. We're going to sing this. It's out of the old hymnal, by the way. It's not in the new one. I don't know why we take some hymns out because some are our favorites. Maybe they took some challenging ones out. But I wish they'd leave more in. But we're going to be able to see the words. I hope you'll sing them. I hope you'll think about the words as you sing. Did you read the words that Michaela was singing? It's enough to tear you apart. We get discouraged and maybe hit bottom and finally beg God to do something. And he's been waiting to do it all the time. Is your name in the book? Please stand. <clears throat> Lord, I care not for 
back one slide, would you? This song is about, this song is not about the past. Are you with me? You want to talk about the past, talk about the past. But this song is about looking to heaven. And that's why Jesus comes and he says, I have a parable for you. And the kingdom of heaven is like. Think about heaven, brothers and sisters. And if you have this discouragement and, and other things, think about missing heaven. That'd be a shame. But lift God up. Think about heaven. Talk about heaven. And pretty soon, you'll walk through the gates. Our dear Heavenly Father, you've told us, you've shown us. It's all Jesus talked about. He could have went to the scribes and Pharisees. He could have went to the Sadducees. He could have told them just what it was like. He could have told them all about their hatred and their envy, but he didn't. He went out and he told them stories, and he told them what it's going to be like to be in heaven. And Lord, these songs are doing the same thing. Paul says, I'm not going to think about the past anymore. No, I'm going to tell everybody what it's going to be like to see the one that I hung on a cross. I'm going to tell everybody what it's going to be like to be in heaven. And God help us if we aren't there. What a sad day for Jesus. So help us to turn our eyes towards Jesus Christ and look full into his wonderful faith. And Lord, it just says by beholding we become changed. Help us to spend more time with you. I just thank you for giving me the thoughts you've given me. I thank you for the sermon and, and where it was headed, Lord. We've got to get our mindset on what we want, not where we've been. Thank you for this. May your name be glorified today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just a short ad. If I've offended anyone here, the dunk tank's over there. And this dear lady has placed me there. <laughs> Henry and I know a trick, but if I've offended anybody, you can get it all out. All right? God bless each and every one of you. I hope you come to the fair for the fellowship, if nothing else. May God bless. This